Welcome back guys. Today I want to talk about the 2UR GSE. It's hailed as a Japanese legend. A 5 liter naturally aspirated V8. Who doesn't love that? Even if you're a German car enthusiast, you have to pay your respects to this motor for what it accomplished. It went head to head with the Germans at their best in the best playing field. And while it didn't come out on top, it gave them a good fight. And actually today, I think it's done something even the Germans haven't been able to achieve. But a lot of people will tell you that this engine is bulletproof. It's the most reliable thing they've seen. Really guys, it does have its issues. It does have its pitfalls, like any performance motor. So let's get right into it. I'll tell you about this motor, a bit about what it's like. I'll tell you about its German competitors, the engines that it competed heavily with. I'll tell you about the issues those engines had, the issues this engine has, and then finally I'll give you a rating of whether you should go ahead and buy it, and I'll also tell you about why it's so special as an engine. So first of all, what is the 2UR GSC? The 2UR GSC is a 5 liter naturally aspirated V8 motor that was co-designed by Toyota and Yamaha. Yamaha have been a technical partner of Toyota since at least the 1965s. They've collaborated with Toyota on many engines, even the LFA's V10 engine, and they've done the cylinder head design and engineering of this motor. The motor initially came out around 2007, 2008. They put it into the Lexus ISF, and at the beginning it had around 417 horsepower. They then raised the red line, put it into the RCF and the GSF cars, and gave it a bit of a power bump. It then went into the Lexus LC500. They put the updated version into the current RCF and then finally they put it into the current IS500. The ISF no longer exists as a car, it's just in the IS500. It had a compression rate of 11.8 to 1, which was a pretty high compression rate for a naturally aspirated motor at the time. But over the course of the years, Toyota and Lexus actually added about 50 more horsepower to this car and bumped up the compression ratio. The horsepower went to 475. And while German cars bump up their horsepower by more than 100 just by doing a facelift, it took Lexus almost 20 years to add 50 horsepower. So it already tells you the conservative nature of this engine. I read a lot of reports, I saw a lot of interviews, and one thing I noticed, a bit of a struggle, right? Lexus and Yamaha wanted to make this a really special engine and wanted to give it a screaming red line, right? Kind of what they did with the LFA, which has a screaming red line, but they were always concerned a little bit about reliability. And that's why at its top end, the red line's around 7,300. They never really gave it a really high red line and they never really pushed this engine to the absolute limits. And if you see some of the German motors, they're always pushed to the very limit. And so enter the Germans. I grew up in the 2000s and I remember when the Top Gear episode aired and they put the Lexus ISF against the BMW M3 and the AMG C63 Mercedes-Benz as well as the Audi RS4. And you know, I was blown away. If you were there and you were watching Top Gear, that time was like nothing else. You had these sedans, right? These family sedans that you know, you could think that regular people would buy and they had these screaming V8s, right? So what was the German competition like? Well, the BMW M3 had the S65 motor, which was a four liter V8. It made about similar horsepower, around 415 horsepower. The M3 motor, the special nature of that motor was because of its red line. It had a much higher red line. It screamed all the way up to its red line. Power wise, it was nothing special. Now the W204 C63 AMG, used the M156 engine and they called it a 6.3 liter which was really a 6.2 liter just at the time the Germans they had to round up the numbers so they called it a 6.3 liter motor this motor made a lot of horsepower it made 507 horsepower and it was truly quick and finally you have the Audi RS4 again more than the M3 and more than the Lexus ISF so how did it really compete against these German cars well guys the ISF was a bit quicker than the BMW M3 but compared to the RS4 and the AMG C63 it was slower the AMG was pretty much like a muscle car and the RS4 had that all-wheel drive traction advantage and to be frank guys at the that time the ISF couldn't really compete with Germany's best. If you think about the BMW M3, you think executive cruiser absolute weapon peak performance. That's what it sort of represented back in the day. It still represents that now. No one is really thinking about a Lexus ISF or a IS500, right? 
M3 is clearly a class leader. When you thought about the AMG C63, you thought about a German muscle car, an absolute Autobahn weapon, and you had the three-pointer star badge. That heritage really helps. And then you thought about the Audi RS4, which was always a very nice stability, straight line weapon. The Lexus ISF was kind of a compromise, right? It's something that you might buy if you're a Toyota fan, a Lexus fan, and you value reliability and long-term ownership. But really guys, no one really wanted to buy the Lexus ISF. And in fact, Lexus themselves had a very limited volume for the car. In fact, I think when these cars came out, they were only sending about 150 ISFs to the UK, whereas the M3s were just everywhere. End of the day, these German cars, they won guys. When it was released, everyone wanted those German cars. So let's now talk about engines. And firstly, I said it competed with the BMW S65 motor. And in the GSF, it would have competed with the BMW S85 motor and later S63 motors. And the issue here is guys, the S65 and the S85, even the S63 to some extent, have all had bottom end issues. The S65 and S85 had throttle actuator problems and the later S63 BMW V8 twin turbo motors had just, you know, I can't even name all the issues they had. Valve stem seals, they had excessive oil consumption, turbo failure, just a bunch of stuff that goes wrong with those engines. The SMG, and that's more of a transmission issue in the M5 was terrible, really a bit of a mess. Then you had the M156, which was in the C63 AMG. I would class that engine as a bit more reliable than the S65 that had its camshaft and its head issues, as well as some injector issues, but still I would say it's a better engine than what BMW offered. Finally, you had the V8 in the Audi RS4, and that engine surprisingly was pretty good. It didn't suffer the timing chain issues that the S4 V8 suffered, and overall it's a pretty good motor, but it still had all the German affair leaks and electronic gremlin, as well as carbon buildup. And over the year, guys, the M3 and M4 motors had upgrades, and they went to the S55 motor, which was, again, an improvement on the S65. However, the S55 motor had its crank hub, which was a catastrophic issue. It would throw your timing out, destroy your engine, and it had valve tronic, which followed it on from the N55 motor, and that was also a very expensive repair. The AMG went to the M177 engine, which was a much needed improvement, but still a problematic engine. The Audi to a V6, which is actually quite an improved motor, but still not at the caliber of this 2UR GSC. So clearly the German motors were just not up to speed in terms of reliability. All right, guys, obviously a different shirt, but we'll continue the video because I am recording on a different day. It is now actually January 1st, so happy new year to all my followers. I hope you have a blessed year and I'm really excited for the plan ahead. Anyways, that's the German competition. Clearly, they left a lot to be desired in terms of reliability. Performance, they were really good, and I would say most of them, probably bar the BMW M3, outperformed the Lexus heavily in a very heavy fashion, but reliability-wise, they weren't really that close. So let's talk about the Lexus reliability. Now, a lot of people will tell you that Lexus is a bulletproof brand and is the most reliable car in the world, and you know, truly, Lexus does top the charts in terms of reliability. And my view on Lexus is a little bit different. I guess it's statistically a little bit different because I believe that Toyota is a more reliable brand. Obviously, Lexus is part of Toyota, but I think that Lexus is a bit less reliable than Toyota purely because they offer more luxury, more tech, more innovation. Uh, some of their suspension, things like torque vectoring differentials, extra electronics, sensors, cameras, all of those things over time have more of a probability of going wrong. So whenever I see these consumer reports or these reliability surveys that seem to put Lexus on top, I'm always a bit puzzled because I'm very sure over the long term, 10, 15, 20 years, it would be Toyota that would rank on top. But how is the Lexus 2UR GSC motor? Well guys, it's a similar story where a lot of people will tell you that this is a bulletproof motor. It's basically Camry level reliable. And it's not, guys. The motor does have its issues. The number one issue you need to worry about is the valley plate leak. Now, the valley plate is sealed onto the engine using a sealant instead of a gasket. 
Now, if you know anything about the Germans, their gaskets tend to leak, especially BMW. I owned a BMW and their gaskets are notorious for leaking. In the case of Lexus, this sealant leaks. Now, a lot of people believe that it was a poor quality application or the substance they were using was not the right substance. Whatever the case is, the sealant does degrade over time and through heat cycles, and then you get a bit of a leak. Now, this affects all 2UR GSE motors. But what I've seen from talking to the owners and joining all the groups and doing some research is that it is highly likely after about 10, 11 years and into the higher mileage, 150,000 kilometers, 160,000 kilometers up. And we've started to see them in the really earlier 2UR GSE models. And a lot of the people, a lot of the owners are now waiting for their turn if they've got the later models, right? A lot of the owners believe that it's not a matter of if, but when. Now the issue with the coolant value plate leak is that when it happens, it is a very time intensive job. And a lot of the Lexus owners that I've spoken to, they don't like taking their Lexus to a regular mechanic, right? And with BMW, there's a lot of techs and specialists because BMWs are always breaking down. Same with Audi, Mercedes and their European motors, they need that level of expertise. With the likes of the 2UR GSC, there aren't a lot of techs who are really well versed in that engine. So a lot of people are hesitant to take these to private shops which means I take them to dealers. Now, if you take them to dealers, you get dealer rates. And for this job, dealers charge as much as $3,000 USD. Now, there is a benefit to it. When you go to the dealer to do this work, it is quite labor intensive and they are plucking things and moving things out of the way. And often, a lot of the plastics and things are brittle and they can break. Now, when you take it to the dealer, they'll include all of that. So that $3,000 that they charge you, if they mess something up on the car, they'll take care of it. So that's a saving grace but it is still a very expensive cost, especially if you've got an earlier, older model that you didn't buy for that much, right? All of a sudden you've got a cost that's probably upwards of 10% of your entire car's value. So that's something I think you should really look out for and understand what you're getting into. And often I think for your car, it might be worth just getting a later example so you avoid that issue or you avoid it for a few years, right? If you've got a car that's you know, 13 years old, it's pretty much as soon as you buy it, you might have to deal with a value plate leak and Often, it's not easy to find, right? If you're buying a new car or you're buying it from someone, there might be a little coolant leak, but it's usually deep in your engine bay and you can't tell, right? The only way you'll tell is when you own that car for a while and you'll see your coolant running low, you'll have to top it up, then you might start seeing some coolant in your engine bay. That's kind of how you know. I think it is literally the biggest thing that goes wrong on this platform. The number two thing that I've noticed is radiators, right? You can get a radiator leak and to replace that, you're looking at around $1,900 from the dealer. Again, it's starting to become common on those older models, age and heat cycling. I don't even know if it's a 2UR GSE thing or if it's just an old performance car thing, but it certainly has happened enough for people to take note and for it to be a pretty common issue. On the topic of coolant, there is your water pump issues. The water pump is interesting because it can happen really early on or a lot of people just don't have to replace it. So I think this is more of a sporadic thing. It's not as common as the likes of the Germans, you know, pretty much for Audi, BMW, the water pump is a maintenance part that's happening every, uh, I don't know, 40,000 kilometers for Volkswagen especially. And then you can have other things like cracked exhaust manifolds, have carbon buildup, though you shouldn't because it is direct and port injection, though I have seen some cases of carbon buildup, which requires walnut blasting. But again, I think those are a bit less common. Now, today's video is just about the engine and not about the entire F platform. But I'd just like to say that avoid the torque vectoring differential. Uh, that was equipped to some of the F models. And if you have that and it goes wrong, eye-wateringly expensive, very expensive repair. So I know it's just an engine video, but a pro tip is to avoid the torque vectoring differential option, though it does improve the handling. So that's the Lexus 2UR GSE reliability. Now, I told you about a few factors. The valley plate leak occurs quite often. The radiator issue happens as well, mostly age related. What do I think about those issues? Well, guys, I think compared to the Germans, those issues are not really a big deal, okay? You're buying a performance car. You're not buying a Camry or a Corolla. And in fact, it probably isn't driven as such, right? And I think you have to contend with those minor issues. Now, the likes of the S65, even the likes of the Mercedes-Benz AMG engines, the M156, that could have proper camshaft issues. The Audi RS 4.2 liter engine as well had proper issues. Any of those German motors, especially BMW, could really end itself. 
And BMW especially follows its ethos through many generations, right? The S65, S85 could really end themselves through spinning bearings. And then the S55 had its own issues in terms of the crank hub. And the Valvetronic is an extremely expensive repair that could fry your DME off it. And then you had the N63 and the S63 motors from BMW that also like to end themselves. So I think as far as performance motors are concerned, the value plate leak, it's a coolant leak, guys. Now, it would be in your best interest to fix that quickly, but it's just a coolant leak. Water pump, it's just a water pump, and I've defended Volkswagen as well. Volkswagen does it every 40, 60,000 kilometers, it seems, some of their water pumps go. For Lexus, it's a sporadic thing. Radiators and H things, so I'm not trying to defend Lexus, right? Uh, you know, I think the value plate thing is a bit concerning. I wish it wasn't the way it is, so that's probably the Achilles heel, I would say. But still, in terms of a performance motor, I think you're getting off pretty easy. So would I recommend this as a buy? How do I think it ranks against the Germans? Should you get it? Guys, the Lexus ISF that has a 2UR GSE motor when it came out was actually pretty competitive. The gap wasn't too big. In many drag races, it outperformed the M3 E90 at the time. So that's pretty cool for a Japanese motor like this and a car like this to be outperforming the likes of an M3. Since then, guys, the competition has moved on drastically. The 2UR GSE, as I mentioned earlier, has not made big strides. The power has remained pretty much the same, right, for more than a decade. And the Germans have just been onwards and upwards. I still think that this is the right motor to have. The Germans have been busy downsizing. Like I said at the start, you had the German eight-cylinder motors this was competing against. And slowly, they all downsized. BMW went to the straight six for their M cars. A similar thing happened with Mercedes. And the same happened with Audi. They went to a V6 lower displacement. The most striking fact is that the new AMG C63 has an M139, which is a four cylinder two liter. That's a real downgrade. You know, I'm not one for, there's no replacement for displacement. Clearly I drive a three cylinder motor, guys. Uh, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to talk to anyone about downsizing or anything of that nature. In fact, I like small motors and I love the M139 from AMG. The Lexus is a V8. The BMW still has a straight six, but you buy these cars to feel a different way. And I think the smaller motors don't quite do it in that category, especially the AMG. They've downsized, though they've gone up in power. The Lexus 2UR GSE has remained an eight cylinder beast. Formula is unchanged. It's just been making upgrades slowly, not in power, in reliability and durability. It's unfortunate that this motor has now really been relegated to a lot of Lexus light models, right? The ISF no longer exists. There's an IS500. So this motor now powers some of those cars. I give this engine an 8.5 out of 10. It's not one you can buy with your eyes closed. Make sure you get a very recent model. You've got to understand the maintenance and service history. And if you do, I think you'll enjoy it. It sounds great. It's a Lexus Yamaha product. What's not to like? Thanks for watching, guys. Happy New Year once again.